happen it tonight. You open up our hearts so that we can receive the truth that will set us free. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, how many of you are hungry for more of God? How many of you want to see God move and do something new? Well, I'm going to pop your bubble. I just tricked you. Look over here in the sixth chapter of the book of John. Jesus was talking to the scribes and the Pharisees and well, actually, these people right here had seen him multiply the food, and then they came and wanted to make him king. And they were saying all these things, and Jesus knew that they weren't seeking him with a pure heart. They were seeking him because they got their belly full, and they wanted somebody around who could always fill their belly. They weren't seeking him properly. And so he told them, he says, you need to eat the bread that comes down from heaven which if you eat it, you'll eat it and you'll never die. And they said, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And then in John chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Now the vast majority of you just said that you were hungry for more of God. This says that if you come to the Lord, you'll never hunger and you'll never thirst. What's going on? <laughs> Which is it? Look at the fourth chapter. Jesus was talking to the woman at the well. And Jesus offered her water and she says, you don't have anything to draw with. The well's deep. How are you going to get any water? And Jesus said this to her. In John chapter 4 and verse 13, and said, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. This is another verse. It says that if you have drunk of the Lord, you should never thirst. And yet everybody says they're hungry, they're thirsty for God. You know, I will admit this, that words mean different things to different people, okay? And so sometimes it's not necessarily technically the words that we use. It's, we have a connotation that we've ascribed to it. And I understand that most people are talking about that they're hungry and they're always seeking after God. But here's the point I'm trying to get across, and I want to minister on this this weekend, that most Christians... I don't believe fully understand what God has already done. They evaluate what God has done by what they see and what they feel. And if they don't see and feel everything the way they want it to be, then what they do is go to the Lord and start saying, Oh God, move. Oh God, we ask you to pour out your spirit. God, we ask you to move and send a revival. And, we're, and we plead with God to do all of these things as if God hasn't done it. One of the greatest things that I've learned in my life that has totally revolutionized my relationship with the Lord is to recognize that anything I need in the physical, it's already been done. I don't need God to move. I don't need a new touch from God. God has already done everything. And if I'm thirsty, if I'm hungry, it's not because God shut the spigot off. It's because I quit drinking from the spigot. <clears throat> you know, we sing these songs all the time. And this, I'm gonna, I know I'm going to make some of you upset at me. Don't, you know, please give me some mercy. I'm just trying to get my point across. I'm telling you that the body of Christ does not understand what I've just said and what I'm going to be trying to say this week. And that's the reason that they're up and down like a yo-yo and there's inconsistency in their life because if they don't feel something, then they think God needs to move. God's already done His part. And if you don't feel something, you need to change your feelings. You need to pull your thumb out of your mouth and grow up and start standing on what the Word of God says and quit going by how you feel. Amen. 
So anyway, be merciful to me, but I'm just trying to get my point across that this is not well understood in the body of Christ. But there's this song about I'm desperate for you. This is the air I breathe. This is the, my daily bread. Did you know that's wonderful to think that God is like the air you breathe. You can't live without him. It's wonderful to think that God's word is like bread and you can't live without it. Those things are great. But when you say I'm desperate for you, that is terrible. That is terrible. I go to a church that has desperation conferences and desperation band. It's terrible. Let me read you a definition of desperate. I just got this out of the dictionary tonight. It means reckless or violent because of despair. Nearly hopeless, grave, extreme, great, desperate need. Nearly hopeless. That should not be characteristic of a Christian in any area of your life after you get born again. Amen. There shouldn't be desperation. You shouldn't be desperate. You shouldn't be nearly hopeless. You shouldn't be grave. It shouldn't be crisis. God has already provided everything. If He's truly like the air you breathe, are you desperate for air? You are, you are completely dependent upon air. You can't live without it. But you know what? If a person came up and said, would you please pray for me? I'm desperate for air. I'd just say, breathe. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Wouldn't pray for him. I'd just say, breathe. <laughs> Man, if they're saying, oh, I'm so hungry. And yet they're sitting in front of a huge, huge banquet. And they've got everything they could ever want. And they're just talking about how hungry they are. I'd just push their face down in the food. <laughs> and say, eat, quit talking about it and eat. You know what, if you're discouraged, if things don't go good, instead of going to the Lord and saying, oh God, please encourage me and oh God, help me to have joy and peace and get me encouraged in all of these things. It's just, it's totally wrong to approach God that way. You are implying when you go to the Lord and say, oh God, touch me and just give me a new fresh touch of the Lord, you're implying that God is the one who cut the spigot off and it's God that's caused you to dry up. And so you go and you beseech God and ask God to pour out his spirit. I want you to know God poured out his spirit on the day of Pentecost 2,000 years ago. He has never taken it back. The whole way that the body of Christ is approaching things and asking God to send revival is absolutely wrong. Am I saying that I'm against revival? No, I'm all for revival, but I'm against the way that it's being taught. You don't get 100,000, 200,000 people to plead and to beg God and ask God to pour out His Spirit. God has already poured out His Spirit. It's on the inside of every born again believer. And if you want revival, then what you need to do is build yourself up. Take the Word of God, renew your mind, take a step of faith, go out and start laying hands on the sick and see them recover. See somebody raised from the dead and you'll have all the revival that you can handle. But see the body of Christ, instead of taking authority, is putting it off on God. And we come together and we have song services and we do things trying to get God to move. And we pray these stupid prayers about, oh God, we ask you to come and be with us tonight. That's a stupid prayer. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And yet we say, oh God, come and be with us. You know, if God could be upset, I believe God would be upset. <laughs> I believe God punched Jesus and say, didn't you tell them that you'd never leave them nor forsake them? That lo, I'm with them all. Did you not tell those people that? <laughs> because we just pray about, oh God, please come and be with us. Why would you pray something like that when he says, I'll never leave you. When two or three are gathered together in my midst, in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Why do you ask God to come when he says, I'm always there? You know why? Because nobody jumped a pew. Nobody's fallen out on the floor yet. You don't have a goose bump up and down your spine. And because you can't see or feel him, well, then that's proof that he's not here. And so you want something to happen. 
And then we have the revivalist. I just got through holding some meetings with some revivalists, and you know what? I had a great time with them. They really love God. They're good people, but they just spend their whole time begging God and asking God to come and asking God to move, and they're waiting on God to do something. God's waiting on us to do something. He said, these signs will follow them that believe. In my name, they will cast out devils. And yet, instead of us doing what God told us to do, we go into our prayer closet and there are people, I'll, I'll, some of you will really dislike me because of this, but <laughs> you know what? That's one of the nice things about as you get older, you just don't give a rip, amen? <laughs> but there's some of you that you're just called to intercession and all you do is stay in your closet and pray all of the time. And you wouldn't witness to a person if your life depended on it. You wouldn't lay hands on him. You wouldn't cast the devil at you. You wouldn't pray for somebody to be healed. You're just called to intercede. There is no such thing as a ministry of just you interceding. There's no examples of it in scripture. You know, a lot of the revivalists, they have people that have sent, they have sent over 20 something thousand people to Ephesus and they met in Ephesus and they refused to allow them to witness to anybody because you could get in trouble over there in Turkey and in those areas. And so they wouldn't let you witness, but they would prayer walk and they would just pray and walk. And, and then they got together in the Colosseum in Ephesus and tore down Diana of the Ephesians and said that they've you know, broken this power. Diana of the Ephesians was broken 2,000 years ago when Paul got in and preached the gospel and as people heard the truth, they got set free and the Demetrius and other people said, our whole profession is falling apart because people are forsaking the worship of Diana. And Paul didn't have a single intercessor. He didn't have a single person walk the streets and pray. He preached the gospel. The gospel is the power that sets people free. But our whole church culture today has come around to where now we pray and put it all back on God. Oh God, move and change this nation. This nation is the way it is because the body of Christ is not taking a stand and not acting on the word of God. You know, we talk about the Connecticut shootings and I wrote a thing and put it on my website if you'd like to go read it. You're welcome to do so. But you know, they're now discussing more gun control and this and that. And there's, you know, we live in a, a society where there's no fear of God anymore and things are bad. And so, you know, there may be some natural things that has to happen. But I tell you, the blame of this is not to be laid at the gun uh, manufacturers or the people who do this and that. You know what the problem is? The body of Christ Amen. has not been changing people's lives. Amen. And you can sit here and talk about the election and the way that our country is going, but the, uh, it was John Adams, the second president of the United States, who said democracy is totally unfit for anybody but a moral people. He says, if America ever ceases to be moral, democracy will destroy America. And that's what we see happening. America is immoral. America has gotten to where they don't care about abortion. They don't care about killing over 53 million babies. They don't care about a lot of things, but they will just sit there. And if somebody is going to promise them to give them free medicine, free this, free that, they'll vote for them. They don't care. And you know what? The fault lies at the church's feet because we've been in our prayer closet praying, saying, oh God, move. Oh God, send revival. And yet you won't talk to the people at your work. You won't talk to your family because somebody might roll their eyes at you and that would be just too much persecution for you to endure <laughs> that somebody rolled their eyes at you and thought, oh, they're a religious fanatic. It's the gospel that's going to set people free. Amen. And I'm telling you, you don't need to wait on God. Well, I'm going to say a lot of things and I'll spend the rest of this weekend trying to talk my way out of this and explain it. <laughs> but you don't need God to heal you. God has already healed you. He's placed on the inside of every born again believer the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. The Lord told us in a number of places, Mark chapter nine, Matthew chapter 10, he said, you heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, 
cast out devils, freely you've received, now freely give. God gave you a command to heal the sick, and yet the average Christian would no more stand there and command healing. What they will do is say, oh God, we are nothing. We have nothing. We can do nothing, but we know that you can do anything. Lord, would you please stretch forth your hand? Would you move? Would you send your healing power? Would you rend the heavens and come down? Would you do something? And we put it all off on God. It's not up to God whether you get healed. It's up to you whether you take the authority that God has given you and believe that he's put that power in you. And the Bible says you resist the devil and he will flee from you. It says in Mark chapter 11, verse 23, whosoever will say unto this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith will come to pass, he will have whatsoever he says. It says you have to say to your mountain. And yet the average Christian will not say to their problem. They won't say, cancer, you're dead. Cancer, leave my body. Sickness, get out of my body. Instead, oh God, I'm asking you, I'm waiting on you. Lord, please please stretch forth your hand. That's a chicken prayer. It's real simple. You take no responsibility whatsoever and well, I'm waiting on God. You aren't waiting on God. God has already moved. God's already done it. You've already got it. God's placed on the inside of each one of us who've been born again, the supernatural raising from the dead power of God. And we are, the reason we aren't seeing more of a move of God, the reason we're hungry and thirsty is because God has put this living water on the inside of us. But if we don't feel it, You wake up and you know what? Maybe you didn't sleep good last night. So you start the day bad and you just start feeling bad. And instead of knowing how to turn on the power and draw out what's on the inside, we just default to God. I must not feel good because you, for some reason, have forsaken me. Where are you? And you start praying and asking God to move and waiting on somebody else to come along and do something for you. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, David had been 13 years since he was anointed to be king of Israel. And yet nothing had gone right. His father-in-law took his wife from him. He tried to kill her. He gave his wife to another man. They were being persecuted. Everything was going wrong. He came back home. His city had been destroyed. All of his men and his wives and his children were gone. And his men uh, spoke of stoning him to death. This is 1 Samuel chapter 30. And it says that David wept until he had no more power to weep. But then it says he encouraged himself in the Lord his God. He called for the word. He encouraged himself and he built himself up. And within 24 hours, he was king and all of his dreams came to pass. If he would have just laid down and quit and says, well, God, how much do you expect me to take? And just start sucking his thumb and saying, well, this doesn't seem fair. Look what's happened to me. He'd have missed out on all of the things of God. And this is basically where the body of Christ is today. We don't feel encouraged. I don't feel like God's here. I don't feel it. So God, please do something. I have people come up to me all the time and say, would you please pray for me? I don't feel the love of God. Would you please pray that God would pour out his love in my life? And I'll say, no, I won't pray for that. (laughs) And people think, well, what's wrong with that? You think that it's God who's not loving you because you don't feel it. I'm trying to be polite. (laughs) Just think what I'd be like if I wasn't trying to be polite, amen. (laughs) But that is an insult against God. He says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Lo, I'm with you always. He's proven his love towards us. And you know what? Your feelings, sometimes you just don't feel right. Man, I just got back from Norway. I went three nights in one week with no sleep. I was on a plane. And you know what? I didn't feel good. But I didn't go by my feelings. 
I got up and ministered when I didn't feel anything. I was tired and I didn't feel this. And you just get up and you do what you know God called you to do. You stand on what the Word says instead of how you feel. It is super immature for you to say, but I don't feel that God loves me. Well, then your feelings are wrong. And tell them that, well, man, I'm wrong. Something's wrong with me. I'm not keeping my mind stayed on the Lord. I'm watching too much television. I'm doing too much of something because I know this is an established fact that God loves me. His power is always with me. I always have His anointing on my life. And if I don't feel that way, then my feelings are wrong. This is more true than what I feel. And we've got to get to where we start basing our life on what the Word of God says is true, not what you feel. You know, right now you don't hear all of the television signals and the radio signals that are in this room, but they're here. And if you say, oh, there aren't any radio signals. If there were, I could hear them. That doesn't mean that they aren't here. It just means you aren't real smart. <laughs> they're here. And all you'd have to do to prove that they're here is take a television set and plug it in, turn it on, tune it in. And when, you, when the television set starts broadcasting, that's not when the signal starts. The signal's already here. You just can't perceive it with your little peanut brain. Believe it or not, there are things that are real that are beyond your ability to perceive. And when it comes to the Lord, He is always with us. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. Now you can either go to the Word of God and let the Word paint a picture of that and you can encourage yourself and keep yourself mindful of it and receive benefit of it, or you can just live in the natural world and because you don't see Him with your physical eyes, because you don't have a goosebump going up and down your spine, you can sit there and say, God isn't within a hundred miles of this place. Completely contrary to what the Word says, that where two or three are gathered together, there I am in the midst. We pray and, you know, when I go into churches, it's not unusual to have them get me in a back room and they want to pray for me before I get out to minister. And I usually don't say anything because I'm so polite. <laughs> but I want to say, look, if you don't think I'm anointed and we're five minutes away from the service and you're out here praying for me now, I said, why in the world did you ever ask me to come in the first place? Jesus stood in front of the hometown in Nazareth and he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. It says in 2 Peter, 2 Chronic, uh, Corinthians chapter 1, it says, he that hath anointed us is God. The truth is, if you're called to do something, I'm called to minister the word, I'm always anointed. I don't ever pray and ask God to anoint me. I don't have a group of intercessors that pray that God would be with me and help me and do these things. And I know some of you think that's totally wrong, but I'm seeing better results than most people. We're seeing lots of people's lives change. We're seeing awesome things happen because God wants to change you and to touch you more than I want to. And all I've got to do is put myself in agreement with him and receive what he's already done, not beg him to do something. I had a woman come to me one time and she said, would you please pray with me? I've been praying for my husband for 20 years and he hadn't gotten saved yet. Maybe God would hear your prayers. And I said, I will not pray with you. And she says, well, why not? And I said, because you're imputing iniquity to God. You're saying it's God that hasn't saved your husband. If God wanted to, he could get him saved. And you've been praying, it hadn't worked for you, so you think God will work, he'll respond to me somehow or another. I said, you are in a sense saying that you are more concerned about your husband than God is. I said, God wants your husband saved much more than you've ever thought about wanting your husband saved. And if he's not saved, it's not because God hasn't got his arms stretched out to him, it's because your husband is rejecting it. I said, now you can take your authority and you can bind the devil. You can pray labors to come across his path. You can pray that the word will come back to his remembrance, John 14, 26. There's a lot of things that you can do and pray, but to pray as if God hasn't saved him yet. Oh God, please move and save him. I said, that's imputing iniquity to God. You're imputing his character and you wonder why you aren't seeing any results. It's quiet in this Presbyterian church. <laughs> 
if I hadn't stepped on your toes yet, I don't know, you, you've been liberated. Most people, I've said something already that's upset you, but I tell you, the body of Christ is just constantly trying to get God to do something that he's already done. It's not up to God to heal you, to get you happy, delivered, encouraged, built up. God's already done his part. The Holy Spirit has been sent. People will pray and say, oh, come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit. You know, they sing these songs, like one of them is out of uh, Psalms chapter 51. David said, take not your Holy Spirit away from me. Create in me a clean heart and take not your Holy Spirit away from me. And we sing that song in the modern day church. Did you know it was appropriate for David to pray that because he wasn't a born again man. The Holy Spirit did come and go upon people and it was appropriate for them to pray and say, take not your Holy Spirit from us. But it's not right for you because he said, I'll never leave you. I'll send you another comforter who will abide with you forever. And for you to pray and say, oh God, just come send the Holy Spirit. It's like slapping him in the face saying, I don't trust what you said. It's not true. You don't stay with me. Well, why, why do you feel that way? Well, I don't, I don't have a goose bump. I haven't felt anything. And so the Holy Spirit must not be here. Brothers and sisters, that's what the Bible calls carnal. Most people get really offended when you use the word carnal to describe them because they, mean, they think that that means you're a God hater or you're an evil person. You're a very ungodly person. The word carnal just means of the five senses is what it literally means. The Greek word sarx, S-A-R-X, it means the flesh as stripped of skin. You, when you say chili con carne, did you know the word carne is the same? It comes from the same root word as carnal. It means meat, chili with meat. Chili con carne. When you're talking about being carnal, you're talking about being a meathead. <laughs> you're talking about just going by your senses. You don't see God, and so he must not be here because if he was here, I could see him. If he was here, I could feel him. If I was anointed, I could feel it. If I was really anointed of God, if I could lay hands on the sick and see them recover, then I'd have a goosebump. I could feel the virtue of God flow through me and on and on and on it goes. Every time you get into a revivalist mentality, you will emphasize all of the feelings, all of the things. And don't misunderstand me, I'm not against feelings. I have feelings, believe it or not. <laughs> I've had things happen with me that I don't tell a lot of people about because if I did, people would make a doctrine out of it and think that to be anointed, you had to have this kind of feeling and stuff. So I don't tell people a lot of the things, but I feel stuff. I feel the joy of the Lord. I have goosebumps go up and down my spine. I can feel virtue flow out of me. There are some people I prayed for tonight and sometimes I'll say something just to try and help quicken a person's faith, but I feel virtue go out of me. And if I feel it, that's wonderful. I'm not against feelings. I don't try and deny feelings. I don't try and decrease feelings, but I go by the word. And if what I feel and see does not match up with the word of God, then forget my feelings. I don't know sometimes why I feel what I feel. I hadn't figured it all out yet. And I just really don't care. Some of the greatest miracles I've ever seen happened when I felt nothing. David and I went up and prayed for a woman in Chicago and this woman had seen me on television one week before. Her family brought her, she was in a wheelchair, she had cancer and she was so far gone that she couldn't, she was on all this pain medication and stuff and she was just skin and bones and she was in this wheelchair, she couldn't even stay awake. I'd try and talk to her and she'd start to talk and she'd fall asleep. And she was out of it and her family brought her. They, they hadn't listened to the word. They didn't know anything about healing. There was no way for me to solicit a response from her because she was doped up. And so I didn't know what to do. I just kneeled down and prayed a prayer. Didn't feel a thing. And I, let, and I started to tell David this, but I've learned enough that you're hung by your tongue. 
death and life are in the power of the tongue. And I thought, I said, I'm not going to say it even though I feel it. But I thought this woman's going to die because she's too little too late. She doesn't know anything about the word. And, and nobody there was believing God. They were just wishing and hoping and praying. And so I started to tell David, I said, man, this lady's going to die. But I didn't say anything. And anyway, it was either two or three months later and we were in Houston and a woman comes and jumps up on this platform. She says, remember me? And I said, nope, I don't. <laughs> and she says, I'm the woman in Chicago that was in the hotel room. You came and prayed for me and my, my jaw nearly hit the floor. <laughs> that woman was miraculously healed. And you know what? I didn't feel a thing. And I've learned enough to keep my mouth shut and not go by what I feel and not empower your feelings by speaking things. The sixth chapter of Matthew, Jesus said, take no thought saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Wherewith shall we be clothed? I'm taking a little bit of liberty with this, but you'll remember this if you'll pay attention. This is the way you take a thought is by saying it. He said, take no thought saying, what shall we eat? Just don't say it. Kenneth Hagin used to say, you can't keep a bird from flying over your head, but you can keep him from landing on your hair and making a nest. You can't necessarily keep a thought of doubt and unbelief from coming, but you know what? You can certainly keep it from dominating you if you quit saying it, if you quit speaking it out your mouth. You, don't, you empower things when you speak it. There's times that I don't feel anything. There's, there's some times that I've ministered and I've gone home and thought, man, I hope somebody got something out of that, but I didn't get a thing out of it. <laughs> and you know what? I'll have people come up nearly every time and say, man, that changed my life. God spoke to me and I've just learned it. Praise God. God can do things beyond my feelings. Brothers and sisters, we're just super carnal. We're going by our sense knowledge. And I'm trying to get across, and this is what I, I've spent a long time introducing this tonight, but I'm trying to get across that God has already done everything. If you need the encouragement and joy, it's already on the inside of you. The fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. That's what's in your spirit, and it's there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You never lose your joy. What you do is quit walking in the spirit and you get into the flesh. You get to going by what you feel, what you see. Your mind is focused on external things. And I saw a bumper sticker that says, if you aren't depressed, you aren't paying attention. <laughs> and you know what? If all you're looking at is in the natural realm, that's true. But if you look in the spiritual realm, if you look in the Word of God, and if you learn to see who you are in Christ, there is zero reason for you to be depressed and discouraged. I mean, even if you die. I prayed with some people over here tonight that were supposed to be dead, and if God didn't heal them tonight, they'll be dead. Somebody says, well, that's a reason to be depressed. Why? Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. We sing the songs, when we all get to heaven, what a day that'll be. And then the doctor tells you you're going and you cry. <laughs> you know what? If you were spiritually minded, I don't care if you're facing death. You could rejoice and say, I know it's God's will for me to be well. He's put this power on the inside of me. I'm resisting the devil. He's fleeing from me. I'm going to be well and rub the devil's nose in it. But if for some reason I didn't receive what he's already done, I'm going to die and be with the Lord. And you could still rejoice. There is zero reason for you to be discouraged over anything. Amen. I know some of you don't believe that. Look over here in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians is a great book. And this book is written from the viewpoint that I'm trying to get across here tonight. The book of Ephesians is radically different than the body of Christ in the way that we're doing things today. He starts off, and I'm not going to read the first and second verses because I've preached an hour and a half on those before. I'm going to skip right to verse 3, and it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. This says He has already blessed you. How many times do you ask God to bless you? 
Why are you asking God to do something that the Bible says he's already blessed you with all spiritual blessings? And the Amplified Bible says all spiritual and earthly blessings. Some people take this, you know, all spiritual blessings and say it's in some type of an ethereal realm and it's not reality and we really don't have it. It's, this is just old King James for saying God's already blessed you. He hath already blessed you with everything. You've already got it. Why are you asking God to bless you if the Bible says you're already blessed? Why are you asking God to heal you if the Bible says you're already healed? People say, oh, because I'm sick. Well, I better stick with this or I'll get off the subject. So anyway, I'll, I'll deal with that before this weekend's out. But this says he's already blessed you. You're already blessed. It's in heavenly places. You know where that is? That's not up there. That's right here. Heaven moved on the inside of you. You'll hear people pray this prayer and say, Oh God, rend the heavens and come down. That's Isaiah chapter 64, somewhere right around there. Rend the heavens and come down. God, we ask you to just send your power. And people think, what's wrong with that? He rent the heavens and he came down through Jesus and he has never left. Jesus is here in this room with us tonight. Jesus is in every born again believer. And for you to say, ran the heavens and come down is in a sense denying that he's already done it. It was appropriate for Isaiah to pray that. It's inappropriate for us. It was appropriate for people in the Old Testament to pray for a double portion. If you've been around Pentecostalism, they'll have double portion night. <laughs> Everybody come up here and you're going to get a double portion of the Spirit. That was appropriate for Elisha and Elijah because they only had a small portion of the Spirit. But every born again believer who's received the baptism of the Holy Ghost has the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in you bodily. You're already blessed. You can't get twice as much from God. You can't get twice the anointing. You can't get twice as much faith. You could start using twice as much faith, maybe a hundred times more faith. You could start using more anointing. You can increase how much you operate in it, but you can't get God to give you any more. The truth is the fullness of the Godhead dwells in you bodily. Colossians chapter 2. Keep your finger right here in Ephesians and look over in Colossians, just a couple of books over. And in Colossians chapter 2, it says uh, in verse 8, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Brothers and sisters, this has happened in our church culture today. We've got religious traditions and doctrines of men that make the word of none effect. We aren't believing what the word says, and we've been spoiled. And in verse 9, it says, For in him, that's talking about in Jesus, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him. If you are in him, You've already got the same power and the same anointing that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. It's not out there someplace. It's inside of us. I don't know how many of you remember all the spiritual warfare. Praise God, it's kind of on a wane in the body of Christ today. But man, there used to be spiritual warfare conferences where we had to clear a hole in the heavens over Phoenix so that we could get our prayers up to God. We had demons that were blocking our prayers and there was a closed heaven and we needed an open heaven. Any of you remember this? And you know, they would use Daniel chapter 9 and chapter 10 and it's true that there was a demonic power that kept his prayer for being answered for 21 days. But what they're missing is that in the new covenant, Jesus rent the heavens came down. Satan has been stripped of all of his power. There are not demons over Phoenix that are blocking our prayers from getting out to God. Now there are demons in Phoenix and I believe that there are principalities and powers over Phoenix. I'm not denying that they exist, but I'm saying this whole concept that you got to get your prayers up to heaven shows that people don't believe that God moved down here and that the fullness of the Godhead dwells in us bodily. 
We'll say things like that prayer didn't get above the ceiling. You don't need your prayer to get above your nose. <laughs> That's the reason you bow your head when you pray is so that you can look at God. Say, Father, this whole thing about trying to get our prayers up to God shows how much religious traditions we have and all of this stuff. Nothing's blocking your prayers from God except your unbelief thinking that, oh God, I prayed and you haven't moved yet. That's because he moved 2,000 years ago and you haven't believed it yet. And you're asking him to move and heal you when the truth is he healed you 2,000 years ago. He put this raising from the dead power on the inside of you and you haven't spoken to your mountain. You hadn't spoken to the problem. You're speaking to God and begging him to do what he told you to do. Most people don't like this because you know what? It puts a lot of responsibility on you and it's, it makes you accountable. Instead of saying, well, I'm waiting on God and I don't know why God hadn't answered my prayer. And people will say things like, I'm angry at God. God didn't come through. I tell you, every time I hear something like that, I just want to drop kick that person right <laughs> off the planet. You think God hasn't answered your prayer. God anticipated your needs. He's already supplied and given you your answer. Before you ever got sick, you were already healed. And God put raising from the dead power on the inside of you. And if you haven't seen healing come, it's not because God hadn't given it. It's because you don't believe it's there. You haven't learned how to release it. And I'm not saying that to condemn you, but it does put responsibility upon us. If you die sick, God's not the one who let you die. It was you that didn't know how to appropriate what God did. Amen. Thank you for that one amen. <laughs> and people don't like this because you know what? This takes away excuses and it makes us accountable. And man, it's so much easier to say, well, I just prayed, and now it's up to God, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. Uh, if I get healed, it must have been God's will, and if I don't get healed, then God must be trying to teach me something. That's not true. Look back in Ephesians chapter 1. Paul begins to pray a prayer in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14. Actually, it's verse 15 here. It says, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And then he begins to pray a prayer. Let me just point this out before we read this. That if you were praying a prayer for somebody, let's say that somehow or another you were writing down things that you knew were going to become Scripture, and you were going to pray for people 2,000 years in advance. How would you pray for them? What would you pray? I can tell you based on my interaction with people and going to churches and hearing people pray many, many times over, it would be something like this. Oh God, we ask you to just pour out your spirit. God, do a new thing. Move, send revival, touch them. It would all be pleading with God to do something for these people. That's the way that the body of Christ play, prays, as if we have nothing. Again, I mentioned this earlier, but I have people come and say, oh, you know, I, I can't do anything. I am nothing. I have nothing. Would you please pray for me? No, I won't pray for you like that because you've already entered into unbelief. You are discounting yourself you're speaking that you are nobody, you have no power, and that you're just begging and pleading and hoping maybe I can do something for you. You've already, you're just baptized in unbelief. What I'll do is try and talk to you and show you who you are in Christ. We don't need to plead and say, oh God, send revival, and oh God, pour out your spirit, and oh God, move, and oh God, touch this person, and oh God, save them. And you know, everything I'm criticizing tonight, I've done it. And so I'm not trying to be hard on anybody. I'm just trying to get my point across. But when I first got really turned on to the Lord, I started studying revival. I heard people talk about revival and I started all night prayer meetings. And I literally, I remember one time praying and we prayed all night long. We would pray 10 hours a lick, pleading with God to pour out his spirit. And I remember hearing myself say this. I said, God, if you love the people of Arlington, Texas, half as much as I do, we'd have revival. 
When I said that, I thought something's wrong here. <laughs> but really, that's what most intercessors do. They thank God if it wasn't for their great intercession, he'd let everybody go to hell. Nobody would get healed. Nothing would happen. God doesn't care. It's us and we make God move. We're telling God, turn from your fierce wrath and repent. That's what uh, Moses said in Exodus chapter 32, and it was appropriate for Moses because Jesus hadn't come and satisfied the wrath of God, but it's inappropriate for us to pray that way today. Jesus has ended God's wrath against us. God has already provided everything. God's power is already on the inside of you. If you don't see God's power moving in your life, it's not time for you to beg and plead with God. It's for you, time for you to renew your mind and begin to take the power and the authority that God has given you and resist that thing. Speak against it. Fight. And the devil will flee from you. You have power. God has given you raising from the dead power. That's what he goes on to say. His prayer here is totally different than the way most of us would pray about, oh God, move, oh God, pour out your spirit. Instead, he's saying, God, show them what they have. Show them what you've already done. Open up their eyes, help them to see what they've already got. It's a totally different approach than what the body of Christ has taken today. The body of Christ believes God can do anything. He has done nothing, but he could do it if we would just pray and beg and plead hard enough. I'm here to tell you that God's already done his part. If you need to get saved tonight, God doesn't have to go to the cross and die for you. He did it 2,000 years ago. He's already paid for your sins. Your sins are paid for. Your sins are forgiven. If you need to get saved tonight, you don't need to ask God, oh God, would you please die for me? Would you please forgive my sins? All you've got to do is reach out and receive what was done for you 2,000 years ago. Healing is the exact same thing. If you need to be healed, he's already healed you and he's already placed on the inside of every one of you raising from the dead power. And if you need to be healed, all you got to do is believe and release what's on the inside of you instead of trying to get God to do something that he hasn't done. It is so much easier to get something that you already have than it is to go get something that you don't have. If you've already got it, you may not know exactly how to get it or how to lay your hand on it, but if you know you've got it, you'll keep searching, you'll, you'll do something and you'll see it come to pass. But if you don't really believe you've already got it, then you'll, you'll give token effort and then when things don't work out, you'll wonder why God hasn't moved. It's not God that hasn't moved. It's us that doesn't know how to believe God. So here's Paul's prayer for the Ephesians. In verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. If you go back to the first part of this chapter, you'll find out that he's already abounded towards us in wisdom. So actually, he's already given us wisdom. We just have to appropriate it. It's all there. We just have to stir it up and activate it. And then he says in verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. His inheritance is in the saints. It's not out there. If you had to replace, if for some reason or another, what you have in Christ when you get born again could be stolen or evaporate, and if it had to be replaced, it would bankrupt heaven to replace what's on the inside of you. The glory of God indwells every born again believer. The riches of the glory of his inheritance is in the saints. What is inside of us right here makes what's in heaven pale in comparison. The glory of God is in us. It's not out there someplace. It's in us. And then he says in verse 19, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe according to, the word according to means to the proportion of or to the degree of the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he 
raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in the world to come and has given us all of his power. And we are his body. All of this is under our feet. This says that he's praying that God would open up our eyes to help us see the exceeding greatness of his power towards us. The same power that he used when he raised Jesus Christ from the dead. You have raising from the dead power on the inside of you. And yet the average Christian approaches their problem as if we are nothing, we have nothing, we can do nothing. Oh God, we are nothing. Would you please move? That is a total disrespect for everything that Jesus accomplished, everything that he said that he placed on the inside of you. Somebody says, well, even Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 4, that without me, you can do nothing. Well, I agree with that. I agree that without Jesus, I can do nothing. But what I'm saying is I am not without Jesus. He never leaves me nor forsakes me. And for me to just stand here and say, I am nothing and I can do nothing, period, and not qualify it and say, in my flesh, in my natural self, I can't do anything, but in my spirit, I can do all things through Christ. For me to just say I can do nothing is an absolute lie and a denial of who I am in Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, we have been given the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. That ought to be enough for your hangnail. That ought to be enough for your headache. That ought to be enough for the little piddling things that people are just feeling like is overwhelming them and coming against them. I'm telling you, one of the reasons we don't see the power of God manifest is because we don't really believe that God has already done it. We believe we've got to do something to get him to move. But God gave you his power. And if you aren't seeing the power of God manifest, it's not because God hasn't moved, it's because you haven't moved. You haven't moved in faith. You haven't taken your authority. You're still talking to God about your problem instead of speaking to your mountain and commanding it to be removed and be cast into the sea. You have to resist the devil. You have to take authority and speak against this thing. Amen. I'm preaching better than you're listening. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, we need to recognize we've already got it. Oh God, I'm sad. Would you please touch me and do something? God said in Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit's love, joy, peace. You've already got love, joy, and peace. If you don't feel joy, then your feelings are wrong. And you just start building yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in tongues. That's what the Bible says in Jude chapter 1, verse 20. It says, but you, beloved, uh, building up yourself on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. And then the next verse says, keep yourself in the love of God. People come all the time and, oh God, would you please just pour out your love? Would you please make me love you? Would you make me do something? It says you keep yourself in the love of God. You stir yourself up. Build yourself up. If you don't stir yourself up, you're going to sink to the bottom. You stir yourself up by speaking in tongues. When you start speaking in tongues, your, your spirit is the part of you that's praying, the part of you that has love, joy, and peace, and all of these things. And you, when you speak in tongues, it's just like flipping a switch. You turn on this dynamo that's on the inside of you. It says in Isaiah chapter 28 that this is the rest and this is the refreshing wherewith you may cause the weary to rest. If you're weary, if you're discouraged, and if you've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I have no pity for you. <laughs> All you got to do is start speaking in tongues and this is the rest and this is the refreshing. It'll cause you to be built up. You've got the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's some of you in here that have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and you hadn't spoken in tongues in years. 
and you're depressed and discouraged and you're praying and asking God to touch you and wondering what's wrong and he's giving you all of this power and you aren't using it. You don't speak in tongues. You don't build yourself up on your most holy faith. You don't keep yourself in the love of God. You just run to people and let people pray for you and you let people lay hands on you and do things and they can lay hands on you so they rub all the hair off the top of your head and you aren't going to have any power or victory until you start releasing what's on the inside of you. You know, this is one of the reasons that I am just so excited about our Bible college and where I am in life because we are teaching these things to our students and our students are getting stirred up and they are going out and they are raising the dead. Did you know we've got now, I forget, but we've got I, at least three or four of our Bible college directors that have raised people from the dead. I, I was joking and telling them, I said, it's going to have to be one of the requirements to be a... <laughs> Bible college director, you got to raise people from the dead. That wouldn't be bad. But you know what? It's so exciting to see people that come in and they get hold of this and they go out and they start fighting and resisting and taking their authority and they're seeing the power of God and we're seeing nations changed. I mean, nations are being changed. I, I won't take the time. I probably shouldn't. I, I won't take the time. I'll talk about it a long time, but I've got a chance to change an entire nation. We have met with the president and the first lady and they're, we're seeing an entire nation change. Millions of people change because of people that have got hold of this truth and they're going out and we're seeing miracles and miracles and miracles happen. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, it's not time for us to plead with God more, to get another 100,000 people to agree and pray. If one person in here got hold of what I'm trying to say, and if you realized you had the raising from the dead power on the inside of you, and if you got hold of that truth and wouldn't let go of it, and I can guarantee you Satan will try and let you make you let go of this. He'll try and choke this out of you. But if you got hold of this and nurtured it and renewed your mind and started walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, you would have all of the revival you could handle. You would see transformation. You would see miracle upon miracle. It doesn't take 100,000 people. It just takes one person filled with the power of the Holy Ghost to see some things happen. And I tell you, brothers and sisters, we've got it. God's, God's done more for us than what we've ever appropriated. Most of us are living a very, very sub-normal Christian life. And we're begging God to do things that He's already done. It says in Romans chapter 8, I believe it's verse 18, I reckon that the sufferings of this present world are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. It didn't say the glory that shall be revealed to us. When we all get to heaven, then we're going to be overwhelmed. I believe what's going to happen is when we get to heaven, we get a renewed mind and we find out that we had the same power on the inside of us that raised Christ from the dead and we allowed sickness and disease and depression and hurt and pain and all of these things to go on. We are going to be kicking ourselves. This is why the Lord's going to have to wipe tears away from our eyes. Not because we all limped into heaven and just barely made it. It's going to be because we're going to know all things as also we're known and we're going to say, God, you mean I was begging for this and this and this and you had already done it and I live my whole life oppressed by the devil? I have people come up to me in these lines all of the time and they will tell me what's wrong with them. And they'll mention 15, 20 things that are wrong with them. And sometimes I'll just say, why did you let this happen? And people will look at me like, oh, I didn't do anything to let this happen. I didn't want this. I didn't ask for this. But you know what? Most people don't believe they have anything to do. So if they have a pain, they just go to the doctor and let the doctor treat it. And then they get another pain. They let the doctor treat that. They don't resist. They don't fight. They don't stand up and do anything, and whether you realize it or not, we just allow the devil to walk all over us, and we're the ones with the raising from the dead power on the inside of us. There is zero reason for us to be sick and poor and have all of the problems that we've got. The only justification for it is our ignorance. And I'm taking that justification away from you. 
We need to find out that, praise God, He that's in us is greater than he that's in the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. We don't need more pleading with God. We don't need to beg more. We don't need to get 100,000 people to join us and call the prayer chain. We just need somebody to stand up and believe God. And I will say this, I think most people do this totally out of ignorance. It's not being taught us what we have in Christ. People are trying to empathize with the hurting so much that we basically come down to their level. And I'm not trying to condemn you if you're sick, if you're depressed, if you're poor, if you're discouraged. I'm not trying to condemn you. I have compassion for you, but I think sometimes the most compassionate thing you can do is ask them to bend over and give them a good swift kick in the rear, amen, and say, straighten up. Man, shake yourself. Come out of this. Don't let the devil run over you. James 4, 7, submit yourselves therefore unto God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. If the devil hasn't fled, you haven't resisted. Somebody said, oh yes, I'm resisting. I asked a person one time, so how do you pray? And they said, well, I, I, dear devil. <laughs> I said, you know what? That's not resisting. God gave you a temper, not so you could get angry at people, but so you could get angry at the devil. You ought to hate arthritis. You ought to hate the cold. You ought to hate the flu. You ought to hate poor eyesight. You ought to hate headaches. You ought to hate these things and not put up with it. And yet it's amazing to me how people just give in to this stuff. Well, but I'm only human. Well, I'm not. One third of me is wall to wall Holy Ghost. One third of me has the power of God on the inside of it and I am not gonna go out with a whimper. Moses was 120 years old and his natural force wasn't abated nor his eyesight dim. And if he could do that under the old covenant, I ought to at least be able to do that good under the new covenant. Amen. 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 And I know some of you are thinking, oh man, I, you know, you're just setting yourself up for disappointment. There's a lot of people that don't want to get their hopes up because you might be disappointed. What happens if I'm believing for something and, I, and it doesn't work? And so rather than run the risk of being disappointed, you just live a life of mediocrity and sickness and pain and hurt and failure and just settle for nothing. I guarantee you, I'd rather run the risk of being disappointed. There's a lot of people that are shooting at nothing and hitting it every time. I'd rather shoot at the stars and if I miss, land on the moon than to shoot at nothing and hit it every time. Brothers and sisters, I, I, it's kind of strange the way I approached all of this tonight, but I just did it. Amen. <laughs> so anyway, I'll try and be more organized with the rest of this and I'll try and do better, but... Sometimes you just need to give a scatter shot and hit everything instead of a rifle shot and hit, hit the bullseye. And so tonight, I just, I want to encourage you that God has done more for you. There is no reason for us to be defeated and discouraged. There is no reason for us to be oppressed by the devil. There's no reason other than the fact that people are perishing for a lack of knowledge. I'm trying to raise your sights and let you recognize that God wants you to live a victorious life. And he's given you everything it takes. The only thing missing is our trust and belief in what God said he's done. And we're going by what we see. We're looking around at other people and thinking, well, everybody seems to be as miserable as I am, so this must be the way that it is. And we need to go to the Word of God. We need to start looking in here and we need to start living up to this. You know, I hope that one of the responses to this tonight is that some of you get sick and tired of being sick and tired. I hope that some of you just say, I've just about had as much of this as I'm gonna take. 
I couldn't tell you how many times I have just gotten fed up and when I get fed up and angry, then boom, I get my answer and I think, why did it take me so long to get to this place? I remember when Jamie and I first got started and we were really struggling. We had a little, uh, what was it, a 66 or 64 Bel Air Chevy? Bel Air? Oh, I was an Impala. And anyway, we were going to sell that thing for $350 and we needed this money. And I'd waited three weeks and I came from 350 down to 250 And still, nobody would even come look at the car. And the Lord had already told me that was the way he was going to meet this need. And I couldn't get anybody to come look at this car. And so anyway, I finally had taken all I was going to take. And I went down to our church and I got mad. I got to screaming, yelling, kicking the walls, groaning in the spirit, praying. It's a long thing. I learned some things through that. But anyway, I got... <laughs> I got so upset. I went home to tell Jamie. I said, it's done. I said, we've got, this car is sold. I said, whatever was hindering that, I dealt with it and it's over. And before I could tell her, she said, quick, a guy just called. He'll be down at the church in five minutes. He wants to buy the car. I didn't even get to tell her that it was done. She told me. And I went back down in this car when you... It, the U-joints were out and it was the old car that, you know, the key, you'd put the key in the slot and the thing bounced so bad that the keys would fall out of the ignition. <laughs> and it had holes in the floorboard and you had to grab them real quick or the keys would fall out and into the road. And it would pump, if you turned on the heater, it pumped water on your feet. It burned a quart of oil every 50 miles and the block was broke and it was just a mess. And this guy came down and wanted to give me uh, $250, had cash. And I said, you gotta drive it around the block. He says, I don't wanna drive it around the block. I'll just give you the money. I said, no, I want you to see how this car is. So he got in, drove it around the block, took off in this huge cloud of smoke. <laughs> we got back around and he parked it and he says, could I please have the car now? And I said, well, yeah. So anyway, he gave me my money and he said, Three weeks ago, when you put that sign on that car for $350, I told my wife, that's my car, and says, she's been fighting me for three weeks, saying the last thing we need is another junk car around here. <laughs> and he says, all I want it for is for parts. I'm going to tear it apart and cannibalize it and use it. And he says, I've been praying, I've been, he didn't say praying, I've been waiting for three weeks and he says, I was in there watching a football game and my wife just walked in and threw the money in my lap and says, go buy the old car. <laughs> so he called and got it. And, and anyway, when all that happened, I thought, why did it take me three weeks to get to a place where I was mad and got in and fought and made this thing happen? I tell you, one of the reasons that we aren't experiencing more of the blessing of God manifest in our life is because we can live without it. As long as you can live without it, you will. But when you get to a place where I've gone as far as I'm going, I'm not going to live like this, and you start building yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, and you start resisting and fighting these things, I guarantee you, Satan will flee from you when you resist him. If he, if he hasn't fled, you haven't resisted. You might have desired, you might have begged, you might have pled, you might have come to God trying to get pity, but you haven't stood up and taken your authority and power and resisted or the devil flees. Thank you for that one. Come on. <laughs> I know some of you are thinking this over. You aren't sure you want to assume that responsibility, but let me just ask you, how's it working for you the way you're doing it? <laughs> if what you're doing isn't working, maybe you ought to change. Maybe you ought to step up to the plate and accept some responsibility and recognize God's already done his part. Now we need to stir ourselves up and we need to get in and do these things. Amen. You know, there's two things that every person in here needs. And that's being born again. I've mentioned this briefly tonight, but if you 
have never received the forgiveness of your sins. That's the problem. You haven't received it. Jesus has provided it. Jesus died 2,000 years ago. There's no question about will he die for me? Would he forgive my sins? He's already done it. It says in 1 John 2, 2, that he is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. He's already died for your sins. He's already supplied salvation. You don't have to ask God, will you save me? He's already done it. The question is, will you make him your Lord? Will you bow the knee and receive what he's already done? Every person needs to receive salvation. If you haven't done that, you need to do it tonight. And maybe you're one of those that you believe that there's a God and you believe that he could forgive sins, but you just didn't, weren't sure that he would do it for you. He's already done it. There's no question about God. Will you receive it? If you haven't done that, you need to receive Jesus and make him your Lord. And the second thing that every person needs is you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You need to speak in tongues. I talked just a little bit about that tonight, but you build yourself up on your most holy faith. This is the rest and this is the refreshing. When you speak in tongues, it just pushes you into a realm of faith that you don't get into otherwise. Your natural mind is going to tell you that this is just gibberish. I'm making this up. This couldn't be a language. And for you to persist and speak in tongues, you have to move into faith. It puts you on your most holy faith. Speaking in tongues is absolutely crazy to the natural mind. The only way you can speak in tongues is by faith. It just is a leap into faith. If you don't have this gift of speaking in tongues, if you haven't received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you absolutely need to receive that. And I know that there's a lot of different opinions about this in the body of Christ. Some of you may think, well, I got all that when I got saved. I hadn't got time to talk about all that tonight, but let me just tell you that if you aren't speaking in tongues, there is more. And you need to receive this and you need this ability to speak in tongues. It is powerful. It's changed my life. It's changed the life of every person who ever receives it. And I tell you, the things that I was talking about tonight, it's true that without Christ, you can do nothing. And the way that the Lord lives in us is through the Holy Spirit. And speaking in tongues, the gifts of the Holy Spirit is one of the ways that He releases His power. And if you don't have this gift of speaking in tongues, then you can do nothing. You don't have to have the Holy Spirit in speaking in tongues to go to heaven. You can go to heaven quicker without it because you aren't going to have any power. You'll die of something along the way. You can still go to heaven, but I tell you, if you want to walk in what I was talking about tonight, you must have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which includes speaking in tongues. That's not all that there is to it, but that's one of the things, and you need that. Is there anybody in here who say, I need one or both of that? Either I need to receive my salvation and make Jesus my Lord and or I need the baptism of the Holy Spirit and this gift of speaking in tongues. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand so that I can pray for you. Anybody else? Raise your hand all over the auditorium here. Yeah. Praise the Lord. I know some of you are wondering, what are you going to do? <laughs> I'm going to pray for you and give everybody a free book. What a deal. Man, I have, I'm not taking anything from you. We just want to help you. And I'm promising you that you cannot operate in what I've talked about tonight unless you've made Jesus your Lord and received him living in your heart and then received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you raised your hand or if you were supposed to raise your hand but didn't do it, would you just get up out of your seat and come forward and let me pray with you right down here and I want to help you to receive the Lord. Let's praise God for all of these. Isn't this great? Face me. Hallelujah. God bless you. You ladies are going to receive tonight. Awesome. You know, if we could get you to kind of spread out all across the front, the reason for this 
is because we're going to have prayer ministers come stand behind you and lay hands on you. And if you spread out like this, it'll be easier for them to get to behind you. So instead of standing behind each other, stand beside each other along the front. Anybody else here that needs to come and receive? You know, I know in my heart that there's some of you who've seen me on television and because I don't scream and shout and spit and act like a Pentecostal, many of you didn't realize I speak in tongues. You didn't know what kind of meeting you were coming to and you may be scared about what's gonna happen. But you know, the baptism of the Holy Spirit changed my life. And I can promise you, we aren't gonna do anything weird. We're just gonna pray with you. We're gonna give you a book. If you aren't sure about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues, then you need to come down here because I am sure. I'm absolutely sure. I'm positive that you need this. It's a command in the Word of God, not to be drunk with wine, but to be filled with the Holy Spirit. If this is new to you, you know, you got nothing to lose and everything to gain. The worst thing that could possibly happen is that you come down here and we pray for you and give you a free book and you go back the same as you were. But you know what? You got the potential of coming down here and if you can believe and receive, you could receive the greatest thing that will have happened to you since you got born again. So there's no reason for you not to come. If you don't speak in tongues, you ought to be down here. Anybody else? Before I pray for you, I want to ask this. You can't receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit until you've received your salvation from Jesus. So you must be born again first. Is there anybody down here who's not absolutely sure whether you're born again or not? If that's you, I need to pray with you first to receive your salvation or you can't receive the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that Jesus is the one that gives the Holy Spirit. So you have to receive the giver before you receive the gift. Is there anybody who would raise your hand and say, I want to pray first to make sure I've received my salvation. Here's one. Anybody else? Here's another one down here. Here's another one. Four. Anybody else? Five. Are you sure? I'm not trying to talk anybody out of this, but there are so many people that think, well, I go to church and I believe that there's a God. Isn't that enough? No. The Bible says the devil believes and trembles at the name of God, but that's not enough. You got to do something the devil hasn't done, and that is you got to make Jesus your Lord. It says in Romans 10, 9, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. You've got to make him Lord. That doesn't mean that you're promising you'll never do anything wrong, but it does mean you have to be willing to turn your life over to him and as much as you possibly can, you make him the Lord of your life. Is there anybody else down here who's not done that and you need to do that before we pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Anybody else that didn't raise your hand? Everybody else here is sure you're born again. Here's another one, praise God. You ladies are sisters, right? Yeah, I was talking with them earlier. Man, this is great. Y'all going to get born again on the same night and baptize in the Holy Spirit on the same night. What a deal. That's awesome. Thank you, Jesus. All right, what I'm going to do, I'm going to lead those of you who raised your hand to receive salvation. I'm going to lead you in a real simple prayer based on Romans 10, 9. It says, if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Jesus has already paid for your sins. It's not a matter of will he forgive you. He has forgiven you. Will you receive it? And if you say, I make you my Lord, I receive it, then that's how you do it. It says with your heart you believe and with your mouth you confess. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I'd like to ask every person in here to pray this prayer with me so that they won't feel like we're just listening to them. And if you will say these words, you don't have to say the exact words, but I'm going to say a sample prayer of what you need to do. And if you will say this and mean it from your heart, then you're going to be born again. Isn't that awesome? You're going to become a brand new person on the inside. Y'all believe that? Amen. Well, let's everybody pray this. Say, Father, 
I'm sorry for my sin. I believe Jesus died to forgive my sin. And I receive that forgiveness. Jesus, I make you my Lord. I believe that you are alive. That you now live in me. I am saved. I am forgiven. Right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Can you believe that? God bless you. God bless you, ladies. You know, you're brand new on the inside. Isn't that great? Did you mean that? I believe you are born again. Isn't that awesome? You know, these people still on the outside, if you were a woman, you're still a woman. If you were a man, you're still a man. But on the inside, you are completely changed. Man, that's awesome. You'll spend the rest of your life trying to figure out what's happened to you. But right now on the inside, you're brand new. And the Bible says that you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that's really important because you were created to be a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. So we're going to just now, all everybody up here now has made Jesus their Lord and received their salvation. And so we're just going to open up the door of your temple and welcome the Holy Spirit to come into the place that he was created to live in. God wants you to have the Holy Spirit more than you want to have the Holy Spirit. You don't have to beg. All you got to do is crack that door open just a little bit. He's not going to force himself. You have to welcome him in. And so I'm going to lead everybody in a prayer, just a real simple prayer. And we're going to welcome the Holy Spirit to come live on the inside of you. And then I'm going to ask our prayer ministers to come up here. They're going to stand behind you and they're going to lay hands on you because the Bible said that through the laying on of hands, the Holy Spirit was given. That's the way they did it in the Bible. They would pray for a person and lay their hands on it. And the Holy Spirit can actually be released through a person. So all of these people behind you already have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And they're, after we pray, they're going to lay hands on you and release this power of the Holy Spirit to come into you. And then after they lay hands on you, not right now, but after they lay hands on you, I want you to quit asking God for the Holy Spirit and instead thank Him that He did what He said He would do. It says in um, Luke chapter 13, or Luke 11, 13, it says, if you be an evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So he said he'd give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. We're going to ask. We're going to lay hands on you. And so after we do that, I want you to take a step of faith and just go to thanking him that he did what he said, regardless of how you feel. Some people feel really dramatic things when they get the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If that happens to you, great. But when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I didn't feel a thing. I just had to believe it. So I don't care how you feel. You just trust the word's true. We're going to ask. And I, after they lay hands on you, I want you to start thanking God that he did what he promised he would do. And at that time, I want you to lift your hands like this. Because the Bible says that when you lift up your hands, you bless the Lord. This blesses God. It's like when somebody sticks a gun in your back. And you go, I surrender. I yield. So I'm going to lead you in prayer. They're going to lay hands on you and release the power of the Holy Spirit. And then you're going to lift your hands and start thanking God that he gave you the Holy Spirit. And at that time, those who have the Holy Spirit, we're going to start praying in tongues and worshiping the Lord. And as we start worshiping the Lord, I want you to join in with us and start thanking him in tongues. The Bible says when you speak in tongues, you are giving thanks unto God. And I know that you probably have a million other questions and you say, well, how do you do this? How, what do you say? I've got a book that will teach you everything I know about it. But if you're ready, you can speak in tongues right now. The number one thing that I've experienced that hinders people from speaking in tongues immediately is that they think that the Holy Spirit's going to force you to speak in tongues. And so they just open their mouth and wait on the Holy Spirit to make it move. That's not how it works. It's very similar to the way I spoke tonight. I believe God spoke through me. 
I believe God inspired what I said, but if I would have prayed and said, oh God, speak through me, don't let it be me, you speak through me, and then I just opened my mouth and wait on the Holy Spirit to make it talk, nothing would have been said. I spoke, but I believe I spoke under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That's the way speaking in tongues is. You have to speak. The Holy Spirit doesn't force you to speak. You speak and by faith believe that the Holy Spirit inspires it. And at first it's new and you'll question and say, is this really God? But if you'll just keep doing it, and my book will explain this, the Lord will confirm it to you and you'll realize that this is the Holy Spirit inspiring it and it'll be powerful. But you're just gonna have to take a step of faith and believe that God is speaking through you, okay? If you don't know what to say, you can try and say what you hear the person behind you saying, but that's their tongue and your tongue will be different. It won't be the same as anybody else's, but it'll get you talking. And when it comes out different, just keep talking. Okay? Y'all ready? Are you gonna speak in tongues? The Bible says believers will speak in new tongues. I want you to say, I'm a believer. And I will speak in tongues. Father, I thank you for all of these. Thank you for these that receive their salvation. We know that you've already provided it and tonight they made you their Lord and they received it. So we thank you that they are uh, uh, the temple of the Lord. All of us down here are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so we open up the doors of our temple. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We want your power. We want the gift of speaking in tongues. We want all of this to operate in us. And so we open up our heart tonight and welcome you. Come Holy Spirit, we receive this gift of the Holy Spirit right now in Jesus' name. We lay hands on you in Jesus' name and say, receive the Holy Spirit. We loose this power to flow through you right now in Jesus' name.